Welcome to Naturistic, a biology podcast focused on ecology, evolution, plants, and animals. I'm Nash Turley, a biologist, and each episode I research a specific subject and present what I've learned to my co-host, Hamilton Boyce. This episode is part two of our discussion on genetically modified BT crops. Hello, Hamilton Boyce. Hello, Nash Turley. For some reason, I had a plan in my head that I was going to go, hello, Hamilton. (laughs) Well, (laughs) you had the plan and (laughs) you followed through with it, just not in the expected way. (laughs) Right. Uh, So we are actually um, talking one day after we talked last because uh, halfway through recording this BT episode, we decided it was going to be much too long and we're splitting it into two so it's a two-parter anything thrilling happened to you in the last 13 hours or so um well i would say no overall no i did uh i was gonna take your advice of like getting up early go out and like do some exercise go out on a bike ride instead i stayed up till 4 a.m working on a mix of a song so (laughs) kind of blew that one but i did i got up at like a reasonable time but i I definitely did not pull off the uh the early the early situation to turn my schedule around but you know you gotta just yeah try try what you can i had the i had a similar issue because i I think anytime after we record i'm just sort of thinking about stuff and then i'm doing other things so i was up later than i wanted to be and then struggled to fall asleep but i still got up at 7 20 and was just like feeling horrible but i was like all right if i go and walk maybe i'll feel better and kind of did nice um so i kept up with it but i gotta try to get to bed earlier to do the morning exercise yeah you need uh, the trout that's what amy and i used as it like hit hit each other over the head with the trout the trout oh is yeah. it like a stuffed uh, like a it's, pillow it's like a hypothetical trout that you would like knock someone out with like a Monty okay. Python kind of situation. Okay, I gotcha. So I had a experience. So I asked you if you had a recommendation for a high energy album to listen to. Oh yeah. And and um yeah, I listened to I, I it was like a compilation from some islands. It was like super funky kind of Afro Cuban rhythms and stuff. Yeah, Cabo Verde. And it's great. I like I thought it's really cool, but it reminded me of a, a thing that it seems like a lot of people want to say if you're feeling, you know, upset or sad, you shouldn't listen to music that reinforces that. It'll just make you feel more. And basically what happened is that music is really cool, but to me it sounded really kind of upbeat and happy. And I was in like my morning phase of just feeling out of it and like sort of irritated. Right. So it was like, just didn't work. Totally. Um, so is that, do you feel like listening to music that reinforces is better for you or that counters your current emotional state yeah i mean i definitely am not the kind of person who's like i'm feeling real bummed out so i'm gonna listen to some real happy music and it's gonna like pull me out of it like that definitely does not Mm -hmm. work for me at all like i'm just like Mm -hmm. what is this garbage (laughs) go away you know (laughs) okay like i definitely yeah i'm the same way like i definitely need something that i can relate to more and then if i'm relating to something i'm like oh okay there you know there's humanity in the world and then i can like start to feel better yeah but, you know, it can be a little bit of a trap, too. Like, if you start listening to, like, super downer stuff for a long time, like, I think that can probably have a, a negative feedback loop, too. But that doesn't usually happen to me, I don't think. Yeah. I think whether how it, like, makes me feel different, it seems variable. But it, I just, uh, if I'm listening to something that doesn't, that's really counter to how I'm feeling, it just makes me not like the music. Totally. <laughs> so, like... Yeah, I think that's the the biggest problem. Yeah, like how I feel whenever I hear any kind of top 40 pop music. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I'm like maybe this is great, but I'm not on the right uh not on the right state of mind ever, so I hate it. Yeah, I listen to um Gang of Four. Have you ever listened to them? Oh, Gang of Four. Is that like They're like a, a 80s... funky punk band? Yeah, yeah. I have heard them, but I don't know that I'm super familiar with them. So it had like the the funkiness to it, but it's got this like really hard like aggressive edge to it and then like you know lyrics about h-bombs and stuff (laughs) right i feel like that that was that was the good middle ground perfect (laughs) nice yeah the well just to to completely extend this unrelated sidebar like for me that's what country music is it's like it's always that where it's like the subject matter is usually 
like pretty heavy, you know, it's usually a lot of yeah. like heartache, a lot of like, you know, <laughs> depression and broken hearts and all this stuff. And, but usually it's like, you know, most, uh, most country music is like kind of jam and honky tonk thing. That's mm. going to like kind of pull you along. So that's uh yeah, that definitely works for me. At least certain, certain kinds. Yeah. The kind of juxtaposition of the, the music and the, the lyrical content. Totally. Mm. Nice. So the juxtaposition we have to work with is bridging these two different episodes together. Right. So la- last uh, week or last episode, we covered plant domestication and insect pests or pests in general that impact crops. And that was sort of to build up to the idea of one of the new ways of um, dealing with the problems of pests on crops, which is genetic modifications, GMO plants, and a specific type of that called BT plants. Totally. So we have basically transitioning into our uh, conversation on where we pick up on talking about basically what is BT, what's this weird combination of letters, and how's that related to something in the world. <laughs> right. Ready to do that, and we'll go now. All right, we are back, and we are ready to get into this BT action. So, BT. I guess I already asked you if you know what BT is, and you hadn't heard of it, right? I have not heard of BT. I had. I have now. <laughs> so, a BT is short uh, for a name of a species of bacteria. And All right, here we go. Scientific name. Bacillus thuringiensis. Beautiful. Whatever. That's why they call it BT. Yeah. So, so that's that's what that is referring to. It's a, it's a species of bacteria. We'll get to why that's all involved in a second. But let's talk about the bacteria. We can just think of BT as standing for bacteria. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I didn't even thought of that for some reason. <laughs> this um, bacteria was first discovered in 1901 in Japan, uh, and it was infecting silkworms. This insect was grown widely in Japan. Um, and it was a really important part of their economy and all that. So when there was this bacteria that was killing off the, um, silkworms, it was, you know, really concerning that bacteria was discovered again by someone in Germany a few decades later. And at that point it was realized that this bacteria could potentially be useful as a pesticide. And so in the thirties and forties, there was beginning attempts to start using these bacteria in different, you know, growing them and stuff as a a bio, a naturally occurring biopesticide to control um, various insects that fed on crops. Very cool. And so, uh, and this is just the straight use of that bacteria and products it makes are still used really widely today. And so, especially in forestry. So if there's like an outbreak of spruce budworm or gypsy moth, they'll spray this, this bacteria, even from helicopters and stuff to try to control these caterpillars. It's used really widely on organic farms, and it can be applied to crops even right before harvest. Mm-hmm. Is it like if what what happens if like a human eats it? We'll get there. Okay. Uh, and it's used even to control mosquitoes in drinking water in like facilities that store drinking water. Mm-hmm. I approve of that. <laughs> Not excited about finding mosquitoes in the drinking water. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I guess in that case, it's it's less a problem that like it because it would be easy to filter out the mosquitoes but it's probably more an issue they just don't want the standing water to be a source of mosquitoes for the people living nearby oh right right. i assume yeah but having all those mosquitoes growing in the water probably causes problems to the water as well Mm -hmm. so getting like mosquito sweat and stuff yeah (laughs) mosquito Mosquito (laughs) pee what is there (laughs) is there a biology term for mosquito pee mosquito Insects don't have two holes like right. mammals. Yeah. So they just have one excretion. So it's all um, frass. It's all frass. Yeah. We need to uh, make shirts that <laughs> that say that. Say what? Naturistic. It's all frass. <laughs> it is one of my favorite vocab words that most people don't know. That's just a great word. Very solid. Very solid word. Especially for us folks who are pretty down with the scatological comedy 
<laughs> yeah. You can, you can throw in frass and really make a poop joke that only lands with like <laughs> one one hundredth of the audience. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's also like scat is another good one. It's not as obscure, but it's a nice like kind of more technical term, you know? On two different instances, I've seen buses that are called scat buses. <laughs> <laughs> what? Was it not the same bus? No, it was one was in Washington and one was recently in Florida. In Washington, I lived in Skagit County, and it was like Skagit County Area Transit. SCAD. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I don't know what the acronym for the one in Florida was, but it was, I believe, the same acronym. Um, and it was also a SCAT bus. <laughs> nice. All right. So back to BT bacteria. They're right. found worldwide all over the place, mostly in soil, but all sorts of different habitats. They have a ton of genetic variation, so they... They can tell in various ways that they're different. They grow in different habitats. They produce different compounds, things like that. And in general, they parasitize insects. And one of the things they do is that when they're low on resources, like they're feeding on some carbon or nitrogen, some goopy thing, if they run out of resources to feed on, they'll sporulate, which basically they go into kind of this dormant spore. And when they're that spore phase, they create these crystal proteins. In the 1980s, a bunch of researchers found the genes that code for these specific proteins, and um, they're called uh, CRY proteins. Not all proteins are you know, easily found. It's not always possible to easily find a gene that codes for a specific thing. But in this case, it was clear that there was distinct genes that code specifically for these particular proteins. Mm -hmm. the, the bacteria kind of normal state is like, single cell organism and then it then creates spores for reproduction or it goes into a spore phase or that part is a little bit blowing my mind yeah so it's a spore in bacteria world the spore phase is not necessarily for reproduction it is confusing because that's like in ferns and things mm -hmm. spores are like a re dispersal it's just like a phase where they're dormant Okay. And they're kind of really small, not doing a whole lot. Okay, got it. Um, so it's like they're out of food. I'll just basically go into hibernation kind of. Okay, I see. And then, yeah, so when they're in that hibernating phase, they produce these crystal proteins. And those crystal, crystal proteins are, they basically kill a lot of insects. Le uh, moths and butterflies, um, some flies, beetles, some things in the bee family and nematodes as well which are not insects. They're totally different. Yeah. So there's, and then there's a bunch of these unique proteins you know, I mentioned there's lots of genetic variation. So these different uh, varieties of these BT bacteria are producing all sorts of different types of these proteins. And so they've, there's been over a hundred of these toxins, um, these BT uh, crystal proteins um, discovered so far. That's, that's really insane. So this is still w the one species of bacteria that's creating all these. Yeah. Yeah. That's so wild. I mean, there's so many species of bacteria. Like how many other species are in that in that genus or family or whatever? Like I'm I'm just it's crazy how much variety there is within yeah. that one species. There's so much that in many cases in molecular biology and all of this biotechnology, it's often really driven by a chance microbe that we happen to discover for some reason or another. And then we get all of these things from it. And then it just, yeah, there's like hundreds of millions of species of microbes that we have never even seen before. Like imagine all that they could do. Yeah, totally. So there's just this amazing amount of unique and uh, complex and specialized behavior that all these microbes have done. And we've been able to put a small number of them to really important uses. So these crystal proteins, they kill insects. But now let's get into the gritty of how they do it, because it's kind of cool. Cool. These proteins as a bioinsecticide are pretty unique because they only work when they're eaten. Most insecticides, they're contact. So they like get on their skin, they go in through the pores in their skin, and they kill them that way. But these only work when the bug actually eats the proteins. Mm. So those proteins go into their digestive system and they bind to these cell receptors on their midgut. So basically, the, the inside of your gut has all of these cells that have basically like lock and key mechanisms mm -hmm. where they, they bind to certain proteins. And then that whenever a cell binds with a protein, then something happens. Mm -hmm. So these proteins bind with cells on the midgut, and then it goes through the membrane of those cells, and then it 
does some madness. It changes the regulation of fluids in and out of those cells, and it basically causes those cells to burst. Mm, delightful. A bunch of the cells in the gut of these insects die, burst and die, and the insect can't feed anymore, and eventually it stops feeding and it dies. Rough. So that's basically how these proteins work. And um, just to sort of recap, we've been using these proteins just as a as a sprayed insecticide since the 30s to you know they they grow the the bacteria and they harvest it somehow and then they spray them around and they're just spraying the actual bacteria itself i tried to figure out what it is they do and i couldn't like okay. they, i'm sure they probably grow them in a medium and dry it out or i don't know okay I, I got it so it might be do, like but. their their insides as a powder or whatever something like that yeah yeah, yeah. i they are used as a powder sometimes and sometimes as a spray probably lots of different ways they've done it but enough to to generate these crystals yeah so yeah. these crystals whatever they're spraying out has these crystals in it those crystals land on the plant or whatever that the bug is going to eat they accidentally eat it boom um their guts blow up. <laughs> yeah. Do like, are the crystals like, is it like little bits of candy or is it just like something like, do they, do insects want to eat the crystals or they I don't just kind of so. end I think up they're consuming just, them? Yeah. I think they're just a- accidentally. Okay. Like they're um, just all over some leaf that they're chomping on. Yeah. I, I could be wrong about that, but I think it's just, they accidentally get ingested. Yeah. doesn't really matter, but just curious. These proteins bind with the cells in the gut. And that binding process is super specialized because these are lock and key mechanisms. And so the same protein will bind to the gut of some insects, but not others. Yeah. So they can be super Mm. specialized, sometimes only to caterpillars, sometimes only types, some types of caterpillars, sometimes only to beetles. Because there's this massive diversity within this bacteria, they've presumably evolved to specialize on all of these different types of insects. So might see where this is leading is that we can now have an insecticide that's incredibly specialized so it won't kill all insects it'll only kill some of them right based on this lock and key specialization of the biological the biochemistry involved yeah very fancy all of those cool things about that as an insecticide made it um a candidate for genetic modification So the goal was to say, can we take those crystal proteins, can we take the gene that codes for those proteins and put it into a plant? And so this is one of the most bonkers things about biology is that all biological life has a common ancestor, which means we all use similar DNA and similar biochemical processes. Mm -hmm. So if you put a gene in another species, it can actually still produce the protein that that gene codes for. Right. So in this species of bacteria, that gene codes for this specific crystal protein. If you are, by some crazy technology, able to get that gene into a plant, it will also produce that same crystal protein. Yeah. Wild. And it's, you know, and that's similar to like, if you can take a gene from a wild tomato and cross it into a domesticated tomato, Mm -hmm. it's the same general idea, except it's going from a bacteria to a plant. Yeah. So the goal, once they identified these genes in the 80s, was to then try to move those genes into a plant genome. The first time this was done was in tobacco. There's something unique about tobacco that makes it really easy to move in transgenes. I don't know what it is about it, but Mm -hmm. it's kind of the guinea pig of genetically modified plants. Okay. So in 1987 was the first time they were able to get one of these crystal proteins into a plant, which was tobacco. Nice. And no one's concerned about the purity of it anyway, so it's all good. <laughs> yeah. I don't think they ever, uh, well, I they didn't ever create a crop with that. It was just like- Oh, just lab. an experiment, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, tobacco is used in the lab widely just to try stuff out. But you know um, the scientists like- rolled the cigarette and <laughs> no, I'm just joking. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so it was almost a decade later that the first commercial crop was corn that had one of these crystal proteins in the genome and then produce, or the crystal protein genes in the genome that then produce those proteins in the tissues of the plant. Wow. Uh, so 1996 was the first time that was used in crop fields. Cool. 311 was at their prime and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I was, I and know. they're from Omaha, which is, you know, big corn state. Yeah, man. Do we have a coincidence on our hands or do we have some <laughs> kind of 
<laughs> un, like historical <laughs> reckoning. I don't know. So, yeah, we, we're pretty sure that maybe whatever 311 album came out in 1996, that was the that was the the spark that lit the fire. <laughs> <laughs> right. Those microbiologists going. Uh, the most common way they actually get these BT proteins into the plant is actually using another bacteria. So there's this other bacteria that causes, causes galls in plants. Galls. It's hard. I don't know why my mouth doesn't want to say that. G A L L S. <laughs> yeah, it's like a it's like a ball, but it's started got a G at the beginning. Yeah. Um. And have you heard of galls? I have heard Familiar of galls, with? mostly probably from you. <laughs> <laughs> So they're basically these almost like tumorous growth in plants, and there's some sort of pest living in it. So basically, a clever organism figured out how to trick a plant into making food and shelter for them. And so the way in which this bacteria causes the plant to make these galls is it transfers DNA into the host of, into the plant using some very unique biochemical processes. It actually, has these old plasmids that basically shoot the DNA into the plant cell. Hmm. So it's basically creating a little transgenic plant and it injects a section of DNA into the plant and that codes for creating the gall. It creates this home that's full of food that the bacteria likes. Yeah, dang. Big ups to those scientists that figured that one out. So yeah, it's another chance event. You know, Someone wanted to understand the mechanisms of how this gall worked and then years later realized that the mechanism that this bacteria is using to hijack a plant, we can also use those same things to hijack plants for ourselves. So yeah, they yeah. basically, I don't, the details of how it works beyond that are too detailed for me, but basically. Don't yeah. know, don't care. <laughs> yeah. And they, they're they able to get these genes and they're stable in the plant. They're, they're throughout the whole tissue and they produce the crystal proteins in, as far as I know, the way they work now in all parts of the plant. That's cool. So does it, does it like become part of the genome of the plant where like it's going to pass yeah. it down to its progeny? Yeah. Wild. It's like a stable part of their genome. Yeah. So there's been now there's corn and cotton are the two biggest um, BT crops. And, but there's also soybean, potato, and tomato. Cool. And uh, on the horizon, there's new eggplant and rice are coming soon. Hmm. So this was kind of news to me. In 2020, in the U.S., 82% of corn grown was BT and 88% of cotton was BT cotton. Wow. So it's, it's, you know, the majority of those crops are now using this biotechnology. BT cotton sounds like a, like a blues singer. <laughs> <laughs> it does. Like he's definitely blind and has a harmonica. Yeah. That's so yeah, pretty much like it's rare to find those to find corn or cotton without BT in it. Right. Yeah. In the U.S. Yeah. All right. So here now we we got a big uh, thing to tackle of the 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 benefits of using these BT crops, and okay. then we'll get into some of the potential uh, downsides. All right. So the benefits, probably the biggest one in my mind, is decrease insecticide use mm -hmm. because the plants have the insecticide built into them. They think over five years there was an estimated 1.1 billion pounds less insecticide use because of bt and remember earlier we said each year there's what did i say six billion that pounds. sounds about right so it's not like a massive change it's like a fraction of one year's pesticide use saved mm -hmm. uh, but that was over a time period where they weren't super common they've recently become a lot more common so mm -hmm. but it was still like it was one billion is that what you said less yeah so it's still like yeah. a good 20 percent less yeah that was also added up over five years oh got it yeah so over five years there was a sixth of one year <laughs> okay so it's not huge yet yeah but that was only 1996 to 2011 which is before it's really taken off to become super common so i think the potential insecticide decrease is larger a more recent study found that um, BT corn had 48% less insecticide and BT cotton had 28% less. So in a smaller case study, it was close to half as much used on corn and a, a quarter less on cotton. Mm -hmm. And one study in India found that because of the use of BT cotton, there was an estimated 2.4 million fewer pesticide poisonings. 
over a period of years, which kind of blew my mind. <laughs> and when you say poisonings, is that like human poisonings or like what are we? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Like people getting, mostly people applying pesticides often get poisoned in some way. Okay. So, so like there was field like millions of people less got some level of pesticide poisoning. So it's That's, helping farm workers yeah. because when it's just in the plant, it's not a, a you know, it's not hurting anyone. It's just in the plant. Yeah. So, and then another study found that it can not only decrease the use of insecticides on the BT crops, but also on nearby crops. And so over a 40 year study in Northeastern US, as the, as BT corn became more common, that suppressed uh, some of the pests in the whole region. Hmm. And yeah. so some of these are, there's two moths that are really generalists and they feed on lots of different crops. They feed on corn, but they also feed on peppers. Mm -hmm. And so during that time, there were 78% fewer, a 78% decrease in the number of insecticide applications on pepper. And pepper wasn't even a BT crop. It was just yeah. nearby. Oh, that's cool. You Like if you've got a, a pepper that you really want to keep safe, you just plant like a giant circle of corn, of BT corn <laughs> around it, like bodyguards. Yeah. So we're starting to see that there's potentially some some larger scale benefits even beyond the crop itself. And so um, the Entomol Entomol <laughs> Entomological Society of America uh, had this to say: BT crops quote could facilitate a shift away from the reliance on broad spectrum insecticides towards more biointensive pest management and may reduce insecticide use. Very inspiring. <laughs> yeah, fun language, huh? <laughs> hey, they could have just been like. They're killing our friends. <laughs> <laughs> right. It seems like whenever I find a quote, when I find it in the paper, it's like, man, that's powerful. And then I tried to read it and it's like just insanely boring and dry. <laughs> I should probably just stop doing that. Uh, sorry for um, raining on your parade there. No worries. I, I agreed as I was reading it. I was like, all right, I'm already you bored. You fell asleep halfway through the quote. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and they also thought that um, although they're giving a pretty promising outlook on BT crops, they also said that there should always still be a case-by-case -case analysis of the risk and benefits. Right. We'll get to the risk in a second. Okay. So a long-term study on corn found all of those benefits were um, increasing the income from the crop but to the farmer. Mm -hmm. It was decreasing pesticide use and decreasing greenhouse gas emissions hmm. because every time you spray insecticide, you're driving a tractor around burning fuel. Oh, yeah. So about they think about... So far, about $5 billion uh, more income has come to farmers due to the use of BT crops. And most of that has been in developing countries where they maybe didn't have the mechanisms to spray insecticide or various other reason, ways of limiting pests mm -hmm. where these crops have been even a bigger benefit. Okay. So it's, it is still, it is fairly well used outside of the U.S. Yeah, it's, it's variable. The EU's maybe one where the regulations are kind of more iffy and it's not allowed in some places, but right. it is used widely. Yeah. And then another meta-analysis found that in some cases, there's also a greater abundance of other beneficial insects around these crop fields. So those could be pollinators or predators of pests and things like that. That's most likely due to the decreased uh, use of broad scale insecticides. Right. Because as far as we know, for the most part, a pollinator is not going to be affected by these. Well, most of the time, that seems to not be the case. And other predators are unlikely to be affected as well. Okay, right on. So, okay, that was a bit of a scattered list of some benefits. Let's kind of cover some of the potential risks. Yes. They come in a few categories. So these can be... The anti-vaxxers some... are getting their notebooks ready. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Um, so these can be some effect on other biodiversity. They can be gene flow. They can be food safety, or they can be... Um, evolving resistance to them. So we'll sort of get into those more specifically. So the gene flow thing is concern. You asked before, like, is that part of the genome? Does it, you know, pass it to next generations? Mm -hmm. It is. And one of the concerns is that the genes we put into our crops could then be passed back into wild plants or weeds or other things. Mm -hmm. And so just like we talked about before, where wild plants crossed into move genes into crops, the opposite can happen as well. So right. there are many crops that do have related wild plants that live around them. Mm -hmm. Whether they can cross or not is due to a ton of different factors, you know, pollen movement and weather and timing and distance and a bunch of other things. Mm -hmm. But especially in grasses, so grain, you know, wheat and corn and lots of other things, there's 
um, various wild plants that they could hybridize with. Right. And there has been one case in corn where they've seen some of these, well, they've seen the BT protein shown up in non-BT corn. So there's like local varieties of corn and then some people's fields start seeing these BT proteins in them because they crossed in. So that's yeah. going from one corn variety to another corn variety. Right. But there's a possible risk of that happening with more fully wild plants. Right. I didn't see really any evidence that that has happened, mm -hmm. but it, it could. Oh, there was, there was one case with a brassica, so canola oil, where there were some wild canola populations of a related species that had some of the GMO genes in it. I don't think it was BT, it was a different one, but mm -hmm. one example of a, a move into another weedy related plant that grows in the wild. Here's a random question. Yeah. Is like when the when the BT genome when when the BT like genes go into the corn or the crop, is it replacing something or is it just adding on? Like is it additional or is it taking something else out? From what I've heard, there's some methods that may cause some other changes, but I believe the 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 bacteria method they use to get it in, it just like splices it in. It's just added. Okay. And adding a gene can, you know, we were saying before how gene, genomes are interactive. So adding a gene could sometimes affect what another gene does. Right. Um, but they're pretty specific genes. They just like code for this one protein. Mm -hmm. So they do a lot of testing for that. So it seems like it doesn't really affect the plant in any other way, mm -hmm. except that they have these crystal proteins in there. Okay, tissue. word. So there's, there's concern that some of the genes in GMO plants could create like weeds that are, if you have a, a weedy plant that's a problem in agriculture, if it got this BT gene in it, maybe it then does extra well and it is a more problematic weed. Mm -hmm. I haven't, didn't see any cases of that for BT. It's probably a bigger concern for the GMO plants that have herbicide resistance. But even without those BT cases, there's been over 200 species of weeds that have evolved herbicide resistance just on their own. Mm -hmm. So nature figures this stuff out as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's a concern that these transgenes could spread into totally different species through what's called horizontal gene transfer. So that's when basically a gene from one species passes directly to another species, not through reproduction, but just like swapping around. Hmm. It happens a bunch in bacteria. They think, you know, there's examples of plants and even humans, and there's lots of genes that move around through various ways through horizontal gene transfer. What? <laughs> I'm so confused. Just like, you're just like hanging out with your buddy and like you just <laughs> trade some genes. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, I mean, it normally it requires when there's some really close contact. So like yeah. there's a bunch of virus genes in the human genome that the only explanation is that we got them through horizontal gene transfer. So humans had these viruses and they're hanging out in our bodies. And at some point our bodies just suck up one of those genes. Right. And those might actually be helpful to us because it could help us um, defend against that virus in the future. Right. Or we become the virus. Ooh. Human genome is full of virus genes and only really the only way that could happen is through horizontal gene transfer. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Horizontal gene transfer definitely sounds like a euphemism for having sex. <laughs> by the way. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you could do it vertical too. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, it's a matter so of taste. It, it can happen between plants and, um, there there's been shown that it can get horizontal gene transfer pl from plants to microbes, but that's never shown to happen yet with these specific trans genes, mm. but it could happen. But yeah, I mean, these are genes that already existed in bacteria anyways so i don't quite see what the big threat of that is but mm -hmm. i don't know it could happen right biology is complicated lots of things that could happen right there's the potential for non-target insecticide effects so like we wanted it to mostly kill this caterpillar that's feeding on corn but other bugs around could maybe eat some corn or could be floating in the pollen uh, predators that eat the bugs that ate the corn could maybe get the bt for the most part everything i've seen seems like this is not barely ever happening. Mm -hmm. There was a bunch of study on monarch caterpillars because they were concerned that corn pollen, which can and does have the BT, the proteins in it, could fly all around and like land on a milkweed plant and then the monarch caterpillars feed on it and get some of the, the proteins. Mm -hmm. There's been a bunch of studies on it and like some of them found some effects and some of them didn't. So it's that area of research where it's like, what's the answer? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> but, 
seems like there's been a ton of studies and most of them find no effect. So especially compared to a normal insecticide use, it's not having much effect on other insects, but it's possible that it could. Right. There's concern that it could affect other animals, like in the soil. No studies have really found much on that. It could affect other vertebrates, but that's been studied a lot in birds. There's no effect. And mammals doesn't seem to be any effect. And the reason for that is that those proteins are super specific. So they're just not going to bind to the cells in our gut. Okay. First off. Second is that insect guts are super alkaline, where mammal guts are very acidic. Mm. So just our guts um, are it themselves denature the proteins in a way that doesn't happen in insect guts. Okay, got it. There's been a bunch of trials in mice that with really extremely high doses, they mostly find no effects. They've, um, you know, most corn is fed to cattle. Mm -hmm. So lots of cattle and cows and chickens and stuff are eating BT corn. They found no effects on them. And there's been a bunch of human studies as well with no clear health impacts. In World Health Organization in 1999, felt there was no clear evidence for negative impacts on humans um, with it in food supply or in drinking water. Okay. Those propagandists over at the World Health Organization. Yeah. Um, no evidence of it being an allergen. So if it was floating around, there's never been any of it, you know, any reported cases of it being an allergy. One of the, so those are kind of all the biological things. Like they're all real concerns so far. It's been around for several decades and it seems to be pretty minimal concern for all of those. Mm -hmm. The other concern is more sort of like the corporate political side of it, which is that these are technologies that are patented by corporations that make them. Mm. And that has big influences on the agriculture industry. That's been a big change in lots of other ways as well. I mean, agriculture has become big business for lots of reasons. But one of those reasons is that many of these popular varieties these GMO varieties, you have to buy them directly from Monsanto or Syngenta or whatever. So it's it's made the agricultural world more corporate. Right. Do they are they the ones that are like funding the scientists, or do they just kind of like end up having yeah. the budget to kind of buy the patents? Most most of the the research and uh, work on this has been done by, or a lot of it is then done by scientists that work at those companies All so right. they do a lot of r&d yeah hear that government fund your scientists <laughs> yeah and then one last final thing is that there's some trade issues because different countries have different regulations on whether they allow them or require them to be labeled and stuff like that so if you're shipping these crops to different countries it's caused some problems and some complications that are ongoing. Mm -hmm. All right. That was a bit of a slog, but we got through <laughs> what is BT? What are some of the pros and cons? Um, I've got one last more thing with the last thing, which gets into some cool research. And that is about insect adaptations to BT. Like every other insecticide, insects have evolved to overcome it. So basically, every insecticide we've ever put out, normally around 10 years later, there's bugs that start overcoming and not being strongly affected by that insecticide. It happened with DDT. It's happened with most every other type. Mm -hmm. bugs, bugs are crafty. They're abundant. They evolve resistance. Yeah. There were some now what seems like sort of foolish statements that people thought that wouldn't happen to BT for some reason. Right. They're like, this but, is special. Yeah. But of course it did. So yeah. the first crop was in 1996. The first evolution of resistance documented in the field was in 2010 in India. So we had, you know, a decent run there where it thought people might be right. There is no evolution of resistance, but it happened. And now it's really increasing. So now there's one pest called the diamondback moth. There's now resistant populations in Central America, Florida, Japan, Philippines, Hawaii, China, it's evolved all over independently to uh, be resistant to BT. Yeah. And when you say that it's resistant, is it like some of it, like some individuals survive or is it like all good, no problem, we can just chomp it down and we're all we're going to survive 100% of the time? Normally it's like they, do, they, you know, 
a lot of times the the mortality was like almost basically nothing survived and then once evol- of resistance starts evolving then like some survive and then you know then it grows from there normally right. it's not they're still affected by it yeah but like it doesn't suppress them completely like right. it did initially and maybe like in another decade or two it might just do nothing yeah it, normally once it starts they get they they start overcoming it more and more right and so BT resistance has now evolved in nine pest species in six different countries. No. And the rate is increasing. So one number to sort of highlight that. In 2005, there was only three cases of resistance. And in 2016, there were 16. So like with most insecticides, the rate of evolution is increasing. And the time at which the when they introduce a new BT crop, the time at which they evolve resistance is decreasing as well. So initially it was more like eight years and now it's more like two. Oh, wow. So it's it's speeding up. And, and one reason for that is called cross resistance. Once they're resistant to one of the crystal proteins, that may give them some resistance to a different one. And maybe something I didn't clarify before, all that variation in crystal proteins, they've then put in a bunch of different crystal proteins into crops. So it's not just one. Okay. They can They can create a new variety that has a different protein in it. And so the hope would be that, oh, well, we'll release a new one. But normally they're finding, well, the fact that they've evolved resistance to any BT crystal protein means they're more likely to evolve it to any new one they, they bring out. Okay, so the new ones would, would also theoretically like target the same, could target the same insects? Yeah, I mean, that would be part of the, the process of them selecting which gene and stuff to use would be, you know, does it target the pest they want? Right. And there's, there's some genes, like there's a specific gene they've used to target mosquitoes, which doesn't really affect caterpillars. There's one that affects moths mostly, and there's another one that impacts beetles. So they've, they've already picked and choose their genes based on the, the pests they want to control. Mm-hmm. But there's different crystals f- for yeah each one of those still yep okay lots of lots of variation got it um okay so this is a study that kind of gets into some of the details of how and how fast this evolution of resistance can happen so this is called a selection experiment is that a does that does that term mean anything to you selection experiment um no <laughs> <laughs> Basically, it's like when kind of what humans have done, basically the process of domestication is basically like a long-term selection experiment. Humans are choosing or creating a certain environment, and then evolution happens as a consequence of that. Okay. So like if they want to, if someone, if a dog breeder wants to create a dog with a pink butt, they'll start selecting variety, you know, breeding pairs and things that go to that end Mm -hmm. essentially that's a type of selection experiment okay you're imposing a selective pressure and seeing if they evolve in response okay word so in this case they're looking at uh the western corn root worm which is a beetle the worm is relating to the larva form of the beetle Mm -hmm. that um feeds on the roots um they they overwinter in the crop fields as an egg and then in the spring they hatch in the soil and burrow down and eat the roots and can have really big impacts on the the yield of crop fields. Um, the adults will feed a little bit on the leaves as well, but it's mostly the roots feeding that's the problem. Mm-hmm. For a long time, there's been some survival of these beetles on BT corn. So probably even when they first introduced BT corn, there may have been some resistance in the population. But they've normally, normally in the field for a long time, it was like very few were surviving. So there is maybe some resistance in the field, but not much. Mm-hmm. But it's become more and more of a problem recently. So they wanted to study, like, how could could we watch this process of resistance evolving in action? So what they did is they went out and collected a bunch of rootworms from the field, from cornfields. And then they, they imposed that they created this experiment where half of the population they grew on normal, on non-BT corn. The other half they grew on BT corn. And they did this in the greenhouse for six generations. Mm-hmm. So they would just be in pots, little cages growing on plants. They found the survival during the selection experiment was about 25% in the BT corn. So that's considered pretty good survival. I didn't really understand why that was the case. They said in the field, normally the survival was more like 1% to 4%. Huh. So maybe it was just the lab conditions or whatever. But the survival was relatively high. Yeah. And that's 
one concern in the field that if you have, you know, the more survived, the more you have that could evolve resistance. You have larger populations. Right. So having kind of moderate survival is like a threat to evolving resistance. Right. So they're kind of creating the worst case scenario in the lab. Mm -hmm. Classic. (laughs) Yeah. After only six generations, they then took those populations of beetles that had been evolving in normal corn or non BT corn and BT corn, and then grew those populations again, and then put them back in the field on plants that were BT corn. So they're, uh, and then, so they basically like injected 500 eggs on the top of a plant Mm -hmm. in the field that was a BT variety, let them grow for a while. And then they would dig up the whole plant, um, with all the roots, all the soil, all the roots, and then hang it in a bag in a hot greenhouse. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so it was like a mesh bag. And so they would, the, the soil would dry out and they'd crawl out and fall into a pan of water. Okay. So it's got like in an, the only way you could really easily collect all the bugs in soil. Yeah. So what they found was the the beetles that had been growing on BT corn for six generations in the lab had eleven times greater survival on BT corn in the field than the non BT colony. So in a, in just six generations in a small populations in the lab, they evolved eleven times greater survival. Wow. So that really shows that you could have very rapid evolution of resistance, especially when you're in kind of the scenario where they're only eating BT corn and their survival is like moderate. Right. Yeah. And so this was also a case where the starting populations obviously had some resistance to begin with. So like it basically it shows that if you have in the wild, that's a scenario where you're at high risk of evolving strong resistance and basically overcoming your pesticide completely is when there's some resistance already available and there's a lot of them and they're like it's not killing them very much then you're probably going to evolve resistance very quickly totally um so yeah that's that's basically like some of the in-depth research on the resistance basically from what what we can see and everything we're seeing now is that although there's a, a, a lot of promise for these bt crops biology you know life finds a way mm-hmm. and biology comes back and these amazing biotechnologies are not so great. And so, but it, it's a, I think it's a pretty cool example where we could use some biotechnology to solve some really important problems. We need to grow food. Half of our food would be gone if we didn't keep the pests off, mm-hmm. but we could do it in a way that seems to be safe and really cuts down on some of the environmental impacts of agriculture. Right. So, whew, that was that's BT crops and the evolution of resistance. Cool. How do you uh, feel differently about genetically modified plants now? That's a good question. I mean, yeah, I, I had done a little bit of reading on it over the years, and my general feeling was kind of like, well, you know, I think it's probably not as bad as maybe some people make it out to be. Um, But at the same time, it's like, well, you never really know because you're kind of just messing with nature and there's always just like infinite variables that you can't really control for or know. Um, And learning about BT kind of seems similar. Like, I I guess I wouldn't, for my own personal health, like I wouldn't be too concerned about it. But just as far as like the ecosystem and just kind of like if if you're going to change the entire genetic makeup of like all of nature and then the pests that you're trying to fight against just sort of like develop resistance within like 25 years or something um you know is that worth it or like are the are the downsides gonna come in and kind of outweigh the the benefits of it or or are there really any downsides that are like worth thinking about or you know i don't know it's i would say it's complicated sort of and it's like kind of it's constantly this race between the, you know, between nature and, and man. But at the the same time, it's like, it's sort of frightening kind of what you touched on a little bit where it's like the, the Monsanto scientists are sort of the ones like leading the charge. So like if it gets increasingly complicated to fight off pests, then it's like, you know, if there's not government funding for scientists to be doing that research, then it's just all these like, corporations and private that's like in charge so it's like 
you know, maybe a hundred years down the road, it's like, if you want to eat anything, you just have to, you know, pay like the, the Monsanto tax or whatever. And other th- other than that, everything is just like a wasteland. I don't know, just sort of like worst case scenario kind of situation. I think it's it's tricky to to tease out the corporate side of it from the biology, because mm-hmm. I think from the biology perspective, I still concerned like there the the potential risk are mostly like rare hypotheticals that could happen, but seems like they won't. But right. like the longer things are out in nature even something that's really rare and unusual is sort of bound to happen. Right. It's like, I mean, it's basically Jurassic Park. It's like, well, it seems like it's all good, but as soon as nature is out with all of its complexity and it's happening, chaos happens and something that we never predicted comes to pass. Yeah. So that's, those really vague hypotheticals are always a bit of a concern. Right. I think when you see it from a biology perspective, some of those seem less scary when you see that, We've been moving genes around for thousands of years, and in nature, genes are moving around all the time as well. Yeah, totally. So it's like not as crazy as it seems that we, you know, put a bacteria gene in a plant. Right. When you sort of see it in the scope of of all of the wacky genetics that happens. Yeah. So that was definitely been kind of my, I feel like that's the perspective that's lacking for a lot of people. They don't really yeah, totally. see that what genetics is and how it works and that no matter what, we're always going to be playing these back and forth arms races with pests. Right. We just have to pick what tools we're going to use. Yeah. And moving a gene around in this way is kind of just the next step in what we've been doing for centuries. Right. If horizontal gene swapping already exists in nature, then this is just a child's play. Yeah, for sure. And then, but then, but then you're sort of balancing that with the, the corporate side of it. Cause, um, my, my, I had such a clear memory. I went to a, a march in, um, Toronto one time. It was like a anti Monsanto March mm-hmm. cause something happened recently. I, you know, some, I forget what sparked it, but it was like shady stuff that Monsanto has done. Mm-hmm. I don't have a, plenty of reasons to criticize those corporations. But then when I get, get to the March, most of the signs and everything are all just about like, I don't want flounder genes and my tomatoes and like basically just like all against the science and the biology and i was like oh this isn't (laughs) really what i showed up for (laughs) right so like those things are really tied together and there's reason for them to be because like in practice they are tied together like the corporations that are implementing these we don't really have it outside of that so right as much as you might scientific perspective might want to see it divorced from that you can't really so Mm -hmm. It's part of a huge shift that's happened in agriculture because the way that crop breeding was done for a long time was that universities had professors that did crop breeding. Like, Mm -hmm. that's what they did. And they were publicly funded, and they spent all their time creating new varieties that would help farmers, and they gave them away for free. Right. That's how it worked. Like the, the state universities... Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. The state, the every state has a, um, a you know, Washington State, California State, Florida State. the The ones that have state in the name are ag focused universities mm-hmm. that would have lots of crop breeders at them, and so it's basically like government subsidized research to help farmers, and the 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 things they created were given out to the public to use however they wanted. Then, of course, when varieties start being produced by corporations, it's a very different model. Yeah, I think that's that's just part of the landscape that exists in agriculture now. And I don't know if there's any way to move away from that now that it started. Right. Well, are the state universities no longer doing those crop varieties and stuff? Or has it just sort of been eclipsed by the, the private sector? The latter. I mean, some of those people still exist, but they basically uh, just move in the transgenes into normally they move it into a variety that was previously created by those crop breeders. So they're kind of building off those subsidies that were paid for by the government in some ways. Right. Um, They're normally not transferring them into a large genetic background. They normally just have a few varieties that have the transgene because it's expensive and complicated to move those genes in. It's some very specialized technology to do that. And I think that's just not the resources at the universities. They don't have the resources to do that. Right. 
that could change. I don't know. Yeah. Here's a question for you as someone who is a fan of insects and pollinators in particular. Is yeah. is there fear on your end that genetically modified crops that have herbicides in them could be damaging to like pollination populations, pollinator populations or species that are kind of crucial for like the upkeep upkeep of ecosystems and plant, various plant species. There is for sure. And there have been a lot of studies on that, especially on honeybees of looking at BT crops and their effects on honeybees. And there's been many, many studies and it's mostly not seen to have any clear effects mm -hmm. on them. Whatever that result was, you have to compare it to the alternative, which is what we know is bad for pollinators, which is wide scale use of broad insecticides. Mm, right. So you always have to, I think, you know, the, the U S institution for, um, approving all these things tends to balance those pretty well. Um, there's other issues with how they do it, but it seems like the U S system balances in the cost benefits of the current versus the cost benefits of the new alternative. The European system is maybe a little more precautionary principle where they're like much more focused on the possible risk and not so much on the risk of the current situation. Right. Totally. And that's just a different philosophy. And I think both make sense in different ways. Mm -hmm. But my perspective is definitely like the world is really messed up. About 40% of the earth is in agriculture in some way. And it's the biggest threat to biodiversity on the planet. Mm -hmm. So things that can lessen that threat, increase yield and decrease insecticides, I think is like worth taking some risks on because we're in the midst of a mass extinction and agriculture is a big driver of that. Cool. So it's almost the exact opposite of the fear is from not doing anything and, and letting the pesticides and stuff. Yeah. The system we have is incredibly problematic. Right. <laughs> um, and I mean, the biggest part of it is habitat loss. And like, you know, if, if you have larger yield, maybe you can have less land and agriculture. So that's part of it. Yeah. But insecticides, well, I think we're just kind of starting to learn. It's a hard thing to really know what effect they have, but we've seen really big declines in insects over the last, you know, one huge study found that insect populations, at least land insects, not in freshwater, are declining by about 9% every decade. Dang. For the last, so like add that up over several decades, it's been a huge decline in the abundance of insects. And yeah. those are the animals that run the world that make our food possible, that decompose our feces. And like the world works because of them and they're dropping by 9% a decade. It's very concerning. Right. So it's, it is unusual to say like a new technology that kills bugs could help that. Totally. But when you look at the biology, it's like, well, it's a specialized protein that only attacks the guts of certain bugs and it's inside the plant not being sprayed all over the place. Yeah, totally. So Yeah, more targeted, less destructive. Yeah. And then I think the, the excitement about all of that, you know, in the last few decades, I think that's why there was a lot of excitement because of all those potential benefits. Right. And then now we're seeing, well, of course, biology catches up. It's not the silver bullet they're going to evolve resistance. We have to use all the same techniques to limit resistance that we did for everything else. Right. The race will continue. Like we can move new genes in. We can, diff you know, one of the things they're doing now is called pyramiding where they do combinations of two different proteins and that in the same plant, that seems to be doing a good job of slowing the evolution of resistance because they have to overcome two different ones at once. Right. Totally. Um, there's a bunch of other techniques that seem to be working as well. It's one called refuges, refuges. I don't know. I don't <laughs> Refugees. <laughs> Re yeah. Refuges. I don't know. I think, you know, patches where you're not growing the BT crop okay. mixed in with areas where you are growing them. And for some complicated genetics reasons that helps limit the evolution of resistance. And quite a few studies show that that helps. So there's, well, as we're learning some of these practices, there's ways that we can, hopefully keep using these technologies in an effective way. Totally. But it's always going to be an ongoing cycle. That's why living in a world where evolution is true, you have to realize that things are always evolving. And that's one of the things we have to do to survive is yeah. keep up with that evolution. Right. I've always thought it interesting that lots of farmers see firsthand the impacts of rapid evolution. So like, I don't know, you might 
think that if we were to stereotype certain groups of people that may not believe in evolution, maybe they do, maybe they don't, but it's some of the, those farmers and things that are the ones that can't ignore it. Like their livelihoods is, can be broken by a example of rapid evolution. Yeah. Part totally. of their lives. Right. Then of course we're seeing that with, you know, that comes up a lot in evolution of um, bacterial resistance uh, or antibio- antibiotic resistance is a case of rapid evolution that affects us. You know, the coronavirus is evolving. Like these <laughs> evolution is affecting us all the time. Yeah. Well, if you want to get a farmer who doesn't believe in evolution, you got to go difference between micro evolution and macro evolution. But that's right. <laughs> I was going to say we'll save that for another time, but we won't save it for any other time. Yeah, it, there's sometimes a disconnect between those things where there's no real way to deny micro evolution, these like evolution within species because you just see it happening. Yeah. But that's a little different than extending that to realizing that all life came from a single you know, common ancestor. And right. all that. That's, that's a jump that you can't see in front of you. Right. Or unless you know how to interpret a phylogeny. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's still more abstract. I mean, you're looking at lines on a piece of paper rather than a bug eating your crops. So right. it's, it, it's, it's a, I mean, that's essentially, that was the jump that Darwin had to make to like make his great revelation make any sense. Like that was yeah. extending that to being the origin of all life was the radical step. And, you know, it's a complicated thing, but totally, we know it's true. So. Right. <laughs> cool. Sweet. Uh, man, anything else? I think that, uh, I think that does it for me, man. That was very educational. I, I went from zero to, uh, <laughs> I don't want to say a hundred, but zero to 75 on BT crops there. Cool. There, there's a whole different set of issues with Roundup Ready crops and, I find them a little bit harder to defend than BT crops. Mm-hmm. But that's there's different arguments for different types of crops, and everything I said for this type is doesn't apply to all other GMOs. Like they're different and they're specific, and so it's yeah even more complicated. Right. <laughs> and we'll certainly see new types of GMOs coming up soon. Coming to a going to be out there. Coming to a field near you. Uh, cool. I guess that's it. We'll uh, hopefully pick a. a simpler uh maybe slightly more entertaining topic for the next time <laughs> right that doesn't require going over 25 research papers <laughs> <laughs> yeah maybe like baby elephants or something <laughs> little i realize there's some sort of giant controversy and <laughs> about that. <laughs> right cool well thanks everyone um all those references will be put up in all the places i can put them so if um you're a masochist and you want to look over that then you can <laughs> I'll I'll uh, have the PDFs of those papers on the website and then uh, the description for the podcast and all that. Maybe some other boilerplate things we're supposed to say. I don't know. Follow, subscribe. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Well, thanks, Hamilton. That was that thank was, you, uh, Nash. Um, you did we'll, the work. <laughs> be ready for next time, and we'll see y'all then. Cool. Peace. Peace.